in a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world. Three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games from our childhood to try to take another look at what we fell in love with. As always, I'm Tim, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, Nick and David. Hello there. Hey there. (laughs) So, David, I think you've kind of moved on from recurring character to uh, main cast. Oh, I kind of like that. Yeah. Although giving me that character title, suddenly I think I'm like doing like a character actor piece where I'm, I'm supposed to be bringing some type of like John Woo-esque manic energy to my character. Do you get like a like a monologue or do you get like maybe some like one liner like, ain't it cool? <laughs> Either that or I need to act, like start saying my lines with some type of like biblical purpose of, of like great importance. <laughs> so funny you should say all of this, really. Uh, Because for anybody unfamiliar with what we're going to be doing today, it is John Woo's Broken Arrow from 1996. This is my pick, and I'm sorry for it if anybody didn't like it. I watched it years ago, back in the 90s as a kid, and I remember liking it a lot. And then later I found out it was a John Woo movie once I started getting into all of his kind of Hong Kong action films. And I was worried that... I would go back and rewatch this for this show and decide, ooh, yeah, that's bad. I, I still think this is a fun movie. I still enjoyed this. I mean, it's it's fun in ways. I mean, I... No, you didn't like it either. <laughs> well, I mean, I... See, I'm in... I'm in I, I've become a lot softer as I've gotten older about how I judge movies. And I have I have developed this other portion of me that really enjoys movies that are... I mean, I hate to say so bad they're good because it's not so bad. It's just it it has like a deep humor to it that the the cast isn't aware of. <laughs> it, it felt very '90s to me, like it had oh, that yeah. lifeblood of '90s. And I, mean, I didn't like it, but I mean, I don't judge movies nearly as harshly as many others do. Even though I may not like, it's like I kind of compare it like food. Just because I don't like it doesn't mean like. You know, I'm going to swear it off for the rest of my life and I'm never going to look at this movie ever again. Like if it's on, I'm not going to change it. I didn't feel the need to change it throughout the entire thing. It was like it was roast worthy. I definitely had a lot of uh, commentary on that. But I mean, in terms of at least it being like critically bad, like, dude, it was like I've seen a lot of Sherlock and this is like <laughs> cream of the crop when it comes to like in terms of like being a movie. This is very well done and executed. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, oh. this this is going to enter my rotation of of movies to riff, which, I mean, says that, yeah, it, it's got some silly things to it, but is also, like, good enough that I did find enjoyment in it, even if it wasn't yes. necessarily the intended yes. enjoyment. Yeah, yeah action like, scenes were really well done. I really did appreciate them. When we go over the actors, we definitely need to go over the stuntmen as well, because they definitely... You saw their faces enough times for them to be warranted in the actor segment of, of the show. I was like, hey, Slater. I think Slater did all of his own stunts for this. Maybe the close-ups. <laughs> well, I think the part of the thing with Christian Slater was he wanted to do his stunts because he always wanted to work with John Woo. So he had to like give up smoking because he wanted to get into better shape so he could make his case of, like, please let me do stunts in this. So I don't know how many he did, but I know that was kind of the... The process was being able to do more stunts, which I always love that of actors who appreciate specific directors or specific people so much for their craft that it's like, no, I I will do what I can. Let me be a part of what you're working on. And it's just cool to be like Christian Slater is a, or Slater is a big John Woo guy. Kind of topical with, um, with like Oppenheimer coming out and a lot of people are saying the same thing about like Christopher Nolan, like what's his name? Matt Damon is in it. And one of his stories is like, he's going through marital stuff with his wife. He said like, you know, I'm going to cut back on acting. I'm going to focus on us for a bit. But if Christopher Nolan comes knocking, I'm going to answer the phone every single time. And uh, just as he basically said that, that's when he's like, hey, Matt Damon, I'm making a, uh, I'm making a new movie. You want in? And he's, yeah, I'm going to have to. <laughs> now, what if Christopher Nolan heard about what he had said? So now he's going to decide like, 
you know, instead of a movie every six years, I'm going to go Woody Allen on it and do a movie every 365 days and Matt Damon will be in all of them and destroy his marriage. That's what it really was. It was actually just a plot to destroy his marriage. He had no interest in making movies. He was just like, no, this is a personal vendetta. <laughs> it was rude to me at that one holiday party back when I made uh, you know, something years ago. I'm Screw her. I'm glad we finally get to talk about John Woo on this episode because I, for years, have loved a lot of his stuff. And I have always wanted to pick Hard Boiled. Um, and I was close to, but I figure like, Broken Arrow is a fun kind of 90s thing with a bit of cheese that we can watch and enjoy without necessarily getting into Hard Boiled, which we eventually will. So 1996, February 9th, just before Valentine's Day, this was released against uh, Beautiful Girls, a another movie by Ted Demi. Uh, it's like a one of the things where it's very 90s of like the, the three guys meeting and getting into the trials and tribulations with three women um, with like Timothy Hutton and Matt Dillon and Uma Thurman and Mira Servino and whatnot. So very different audiences going out for Broken Arrow that week. But February 1996 was kind of a like a gangbusters month in hindsight because this was the month that gave us uh, for anybody else, ever. Have you guys seen White Squall? Oh, oh yes. Oh, so such good. a good movie. Uh, so White Squall came out, I think, like the weekend before. This was the same month as Happy Gilmore, Bottle Rocket with Wes Anderson kind of starting the scene. Jackie Chan and Rumble in the Bronx. And Ooh. David, you might know this one. Uh, it opened, I think, one week before Muppet Treasure Island. I really I would was, know that, too. Wow. That's when Muppet Treasure Island came out. So February 1996. Just, huh? man. It feels, like, just like, it feels like yesterday. I mean, yeah. you know, it's just so, so recent in my mind. Although, I mean, that's also on my regular rotation of movies to watch. So, you know, although that one's not riff. That's that's pure. That, Enjoy that's pure the, cut. It's <laughs> pure cut. Just unadulterated Muppet. I love you bringing, bringing back memories of me for, for White Squall. Like, that movie <laughs> scarred me. Like, that was that was a devastatingly sad film. And I'm just like, flashbacks all of a sudden. I'm like, oh, God, those drowning scenes at the end. We're, we're going to do double feature of White Squall and the Perfect Storm. <laughs> and make nobody get on a boat for the rest of their lives you were saying nick uh that meme with um the muppet movies on why they worked so well with michael kane and um tim curry was that um it worked so well because they took their roles very seriously whereas michael kane treated the other muppets like other actors tim curry just treated himself like he was another muppet that's right <laughs> that's I remember that one more. love that <laughs> I uh, I loved I loved I mean this not to get too far off on the Muppets but I I do remember there was a, a great meme about to pick a new movie that the Muppets could be in it's like what what movie would you pick to recast with Muppets and one human and which oh. one would it be and the best and only real answer is Harry Potter and you were, you place everyone of Muppets except Snape. <laughs> <laughs> I like too, especially with keeping the whole Matt Damon thing, like The Martian. <laughs> you filmed the movie exactly how it was, except everyone on Earth is a Muppet. You just pan to like ground control and it's just a room full of Muppets <laughs> just losing it. <laughs> now, I always said Texas Chainsaw Massacre and keep Leatherface. <laughs> so, Broken Arrow, a uh, budget of 50 million, box office did 150.2, so it Definitely seemed like it made its money back. I think this was during the time when John Woo was really hitting the scene on the, the U.S. side hard. Because for years he had been overseas doing all of the, the action movies that everybody kind of emulated at the time. All the stuff that we came to love. So like Hard Boiled, The Killer, Bullet in the Head, uh, Better Tomorrow. And then he came over to the U.S. And then that's when he was doing, he came off with Hard Target with Sean Claude Van Damme. He did Broken Arrow. He continued on with like Face Off. He got to do Mission Impossible 2. Less or so, he did like Wind Talkers, Paycheck. Um, and he did a TV movie that I don't know if anybody remembers called Blackjack with Dolph Lundgren. Uh, that was supposed to be a backdoor pilot to a show that never got picked up. But I remember it because it was, he's like a, a bodyguard or something, but he's leukophobic. So it just means he has a fair of the color white that they incorporate as a plot point of like 
villains will somehow exploit the color white of being like, oh, they ran through a room with white curtains and he, he couldn't look at them to shoot. It's just... Is he, is he like an old-fashioned Green Lantern? Where, like, he can't affect certain <laughs> yeah. colors? I can't He's handle like, the color oh, no. white and wood. <laughs> it's like they just paint a bus white and just drive it at him. He's like, no, there's nothing I can do. And he just gets run over. It's like, I still see it. I just don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> it's not invisible. <laughs> So, yeah, he, he ended up doing all of those um, to kind of varying degrees, which I know we were talking to off show, David, about John Woo coming over to the U.S. and feeling like a very different director here. That almost feels like the the exaggerated version. And I don't know if that's just, hey, all of these stuff that we love that you did overseas, come bring that here. But like everybody always remember it's kind of like Nicolas Cage. He's a great actor. I love Nicolas Cage. But everybody over time has a very specific Nicolas Cage that they want. It's not like, hey, I want the the leaving Las Vegas or I want the it could happen to you Nicolas Cage. It's no, give me the raving crazy Nicolas Cage in our movie. And that might be what they went with with John Woo of just, no, we want the give us that like high action, crazy, artistic everything. Or it could just be, hey, he now has massive budgets. He has U.S. budgets do what you want and then that's just what it turns into i think it turned into um i want john travolta again well sir you have him again like well then find another actor that can be john travolta just do it <laughs> i don't care i want more john travolta in this movie i just i just want these two actors to face off to face <laughs> off face off <laughs> He's like that. That that's my movie. Um, I I like. I really like that budget idea because it, it's funny. When I was uh, doing research around this film, I thought it was kind of funny because you know, Broken Arrow feels like that kind of manic, high energy John Woo film. But originally, it you know, this is uh, like an hour twenty ish runtime, maybe a little less. Um, but his original cut was two hours, uh, and was a much bloodier, much more like high octane violence film before it was cut down by censors uh, in the studio. So like, I think this is even a, uh, an even more moderate <laughs> version of what John, John Woo might've been going for. Which probably ends up making it seem more like that frenetic energy to this whole thing is, yeah, we distilled this down to like an hour and 20 change or something like that. Because mm -hmm. you're right, if it was the full cut, I wonder if it would have played more along the lines of like some of his other work, which I think loving like Hard Boiled, loving The Killer, loving all that. I think this is, I try to picture his American movies and think like, okay, but is this something that he would have done back overseas of like, where could Chow Yun Fat, like just drop him in as the Christian Slater role or something like, or Tony Leung or something? Or is it so organically different that it's, no, nobody could have worked in this except if they did this with like a Christian Slater and a John Travolta or a Nicolas Cage and a John Travolta or a John Travolta and somebody. John Travolta is really the linchpin holding together the first six years of John Woo in the U.S. Yeah, it's funny because Broken Arrow is, is such a quintessential American film in its feel and style yeah in, in terms of like its style the story that it's telling and even like the, the kind of buddy cop tension you know friends turned enemies kind of storyline feels so early late 80s early 90s like that era in american filmmaking that i it i almost can't see it translating translating over to, to you know john was more classic films like it just feels it, it kind of it don't it kind of feels like you know, John Woo was like, I'm going to make an American film, like, but kind of my way. Well, I mean, right there, the idea of the like brother against brother kind of thing, the whole John Travolta, Christian Slater, like that works well with a lot of other Hong Kong cinema of a lot of the, well, one of them became a cop and one of them became a criminal or like all of that kind of mentality. But like you said, like this, this is wholly American of yeah, we had so many nukes. We were just using it for a testing <laughs> exercise and we just got, somebody stole them. Why did they steal them? Greed. <laughs> okay, well, cast a U.S. cast. Yeah, it's just like uh, early 90s, like American military or just action films in general. So many of them were about like, oh man, the nukes though. Like what happened yeah. to the nukes? Who stole the nukes? Who's buying the nukes? Uh, so like to have that to be the linchpin premise, it's just like, like this, like, like this is an American movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
so yeah so following all of that he did go back um overseas he started doing more movies like red cliffs part one and two this two-part epic but evidently he's coming back to the u.s and he just did a movie with joel kinnaman that hasn't released yet called silent night that is entirely a silent action film uh there is no dialogue in it it's just sound but it, it no talking at all it's just a like a kid gets kidnapped or something, so the father just has to like hunt him down and start delving into the underworld and try to figure out like where the child got taken um, and get him back. But it's I'm really interested in seeing like what does John Woo do where all the movie is just micro acting, no dialogue, and then action sequences. So he he hires John Travolta and um, Nicolas Cage, and they just do close-ups of like wide eyes and like dramatic <laughs> head gestation is like whipping their heads around <laughs> watching this actually kind of made me think like you know it felt like john travolta was trying to go for the same career as tom cruise they almost had mm. a similar start and just seeing him act in this and this he's man, he's manic as hell he's extremely like a wild card and around this same time too he had just done pulp fiction just like two years prior but before that, he was still known as like the Grease John Travolta or the Saturday Night Fever John Travolta. And this was him, I guess, like really actively trying to break out from that. And I've noticed he'd done a lot of like war movies specifically or like military type movies afterward leading up to, you know, but in the very early beginning, I'm like, I noticed that he's going for like these high action kind of movies. And I'm thinking like, man, maybe in another universe, like John Travolta has become you know, Tom Cruise and Tom Cruise didn't make it up to that level that he currently is now. Well, I think I always respected John Travolta overall, just because, like you said, he didn't always put himself into one box. It's, yes, I will do a musical. Yes, I will do a dance movie, like a drama. Like, yes, I will do action sequences. I'll play a villain. I'll play a hero. Like, it always seemed more so like what seems fun, what seems interesting. Sure. Yeah, I'll do that. But it's getting away from some of the stuff he did early, like you said, like, oh, he Urban Cowboy and Blowout and Staying Alive and Saturday Night Fever and the Look Who's Talking movies. But then it hit that, like, early 90s of Pulp Fiction, then he did Get Shorty, then he does, like, Broken Arrow, then he does, like, Mad City. Like, he's doing all of these things that are a little bit more quirky, which if anybody hasn't seen, like, Get Shorty, I always liked him in Get Shorty. Be Cool is okay, too. Um, not so much, though. But I think John Travolta has never really had stuff that I'm just bored with. It's funny thinking of John Travolta's John Travolta's career in general, because like I'm I'm like thinking about it and like scrolling through his like filmography, and I'm just like he's done a lot, but like nothing that's been like a real huge hit. Like I almost wonder if that's kind of like what separates him from like that potential like Tom Cruise level stardom. Is well, that like he did like movies like that? Those kind of like you know military action -y early 90s films but like i don't think he really had like a like a huge film like i'm trying to think what what he what film he would be most known for probably i hate to say it but like battlefield earth <laughs> oh wow and that, and that and that just it backfired i mean they didn't expect it to be bad but it it was yeah and i'm just thinking i'm like thinking i'm like i'm like swordfish like swordfish was good it wasn't like amazing i mean as what is he remembered as in terms of just like the the movie itself or in terms of something like a a large scale like blockbuster like, type right thing? like i'm saying like it, it feels like in his career he's never had like a large blockbuster hit which which might have which might have been the thing that was missing from his career to really like elevate him to like getting more like triple a like well, films because I think he never really had that kind of role. Everything that was very popular was always more of like a, like your Pulp Fictions or things. It's more like a, a cultural hit rather than, oh my God, you have to go see Jaws. Like it's not some big summer blockbuster. It was right. always like, no, it's a very popular movie. A lot of people love it. It became a cult favorite or something, but it's not necessarily like the, the oh my God, you have to go see such and such. Like, Oh yeah. I mean, John Travolta has a lot of like cult hits, like movies that I will watch. Like, yeah. I mean, just, I mean, even just what I said with like Swordfish, The Taking of Pelham, I can't remember. Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three. You know, Broken Arrow, Michael is great. Um, face Off, for that matter. Yeah, like Face Off. Face Off would probably be the most 
like the largest, most summer blockbustery. Yeah. Other than like you said, Battlefield Earth that just Well, that's why I like floundered. consider like an alternate universe where it would have worked because you can see that he did go for big movies, but they just they flopped. I haven't pulled up Tom Cruise's side by side, but I'm pretty sure like a lot of those had the potential of becoming super big and huge. You know, like broke Broken Arrow, why did he join it? Probably because he already knew John Woo's style, and he's like, this guy is definitely like a meal ticket for bigger and better projects, and it, it just didn't do anything. Yeah, I even, I even think about, like, uh, John Trolls, uh, the general's daughter, which was that, like, yes. military officer, high-ranking espionage thing, and, like, I can see direct comparisons of that with, like, a few good men. It was, like, yeah. it's kind of John Travolta's version, but it just didn't blow up in the same way. As far as military John Travolta, before we move on to the writer, um, if anybody's ever seen Basic by John McTiernan, it's a box office bomb, but I think it's fun of it's jumping between a, it's kind of like, um, like Rashomon of here's a bunch of different takes on a military situation where they're doing like the, the after the fact internal, like affairs review of something that happened during a military exercise and you're trying to figure out like i think it was like somebody died on it and they're trying to figure out what it was and he's involved but they're jumping between every interview and how they saw what happened and what was involved but that that one i enjoyed personally the the way that the story told is told it took me a minute to like remember this film uh is really really cool because it's a kind of mystery that is unveiled to you with each new telling and like yeah. the unreliable narrator and like how things kind of cross and cover each other up and this very like slow burning like until you get to like the real truth of the story i also remember it because when i was talking about how they fit dancing into things at towards the end of the movie there is a sequence where uh he's just partying and he just starts dancing and they somehow fit it in a military movie of john travolta bust a move i was saying like even in, even in michael he did a little bit of dancing oh yeah uh, <laughs> i wonder if he's just because he enjoys it it's just like yeah do a couple dance movies like okay it's like the tom Ain't cruise cool. running thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, t- yeah we're re-watching the mission impossible movies and every time it starts i'm just like there he goes tom cruise running um so <laughs> aside from john woo and john travolta graham yost ended up doing the the writing on this he also did speed previously so kind of coming off of speed the movie that is he ended up doing uh this he did hard rain with also christian slater which is another fun one i think morgan freeman is the bad guy in that one where it's just like there is this massive flood and they're taking it as an opportunity to like rob a location while it's flooding um and also he did 13 episodes of hey dude so when you watch Broken Arrow, just think, you know what? This is the guy that wrote Hey Dude. This is also the guy that did uh, Speed 2 Cruise Control. So for every point you give him, you got to take it back. Hey, I mean, he was also <laughs> the executive producer of the uh, the new um, HBO Max show, Silo, which I'm a huge fan of. I have not started watching that. Oh, it's so he good. He did two episodes of Brian and Brothers and the Pacific. Oh. Also, for anyone unaware listening to this movie, the music was done by Hans Zimmer, uh, of Pirates of the Caribbean, everything with Christopher Nolan, Gladiator, uh, and something that bugged me the entire movie is I was listening to the soundtrack, and I think the the track is called like Rope a Dope or something, but there's like a Dwayne Eddy guitar riff in it, and listening to the music, and like I'll I'll play a quick clip here. <laughs> listening to that i'm like oh i remember this song so well but like i don't remember seeing broken arrow enough times as a kid like i've seen it once to remember that track specifically it's because han zimmer reused it for two other movies that he did yeah i was gonna say i think i think there was some music from this that was actually used in scream yep so scream 2 he reused that track which now makes sense of like oh i've seen that a lot more times than i've seen broken arrow that's where it came from because I guess it was Scream 2 and I think it was Speed 2. So it was just a lot of the twos. I was, was going to say, I don't, I don't think that's something you should really tell people that you've seen Scream 2 a lot. <laughs> hey, we'll get. I'll bring you on my other show, but we'll talk Scream. Um, Scream 2, I think, is a perfectly fine film. Anyway, I think he's probably realized that um, like this is too good to just leave it for Broken Arrow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this for something else. <laughs> this is too like, good for real Broken proud Arrow. Of it. I need to use it for Speed 2. Nobody heard this song anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like, I, I love your work, just as long as you don't recognize it, because I'm going to drop five tracks I've used previously in your movie. So yeah, so before we get into this real quick, we mentioned John Travolta, Christian Slater uh, as Captain Riley Hale, the foil to him throughout this movie. I always had a soft spot for Christian Slater. I love him in anything he's in. I always think he adds like a a fun, kind of a smart ass, but he's always the lovable smart ass um, yeah. to this movie. I love seeing Samantha Mathis again that we talked about previously on the Super Mario Brothers movie. She plays the park ranger, Terry Carmichael, and then just a absolute gold cast the rest of this thing of people that you'll recognize between like Delroy Lindo as the Air Force Colonel to Frank Whaley, who's like the analyst that's working with them. Bob Gunton as the uh, smarmy guile or Mr. Pritchard that uh, is involved with John Travolta's thing. Uh, Howie Long who I guess was supposed to die earlier in the film, but they just enjoyed him so much, they decided like, no, 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 let's expand this out and keep him as like the main henchman, um, which Howie Long, I think, went on afterwards uh, to do the movie, uh, I think Firestorm, where he plays like a heroic firefighter in the middle of the woods or something. And I just remember the one scene of him throwing an ax like through the fire at somebody. If you like Broken Arrow, you will love Firestorm because it's very similar in terms of tone. Um, but then we get uh, Kurtwood Smith the as the Secretary of Defense, a famous, uh, oh, this son of a bitch in every single movie you see because he's always essentially playing the same role. Uh, you know him as Red from that 70s show. He was in The Father and Dead Poet Society. Uh, he was in RoboCop. He's in everything. Same with some of the others. Uh, Daniel Von Bargen, who played the general. Uh, Vondi Curtis Hall, who was one of the other pararescues. He ends up later going on to play like Ben Urich in Tear Devil. So many people in this movie that I don't know if it was just hey, it's the 90s, everybody is at their heyday, cast them all, or it was just, hey, John Woo is doing an American movie. We all want to be in it. I mean, honestly, it might be the second. Uh, it is funny, like, as you're going from scene to scene, and you're just, like, you're just recognizing faces <laughs> from, like, people, yeah. like, in, in their prime in the 90s. Like, when, you know, we're going to, like, the, the, the ground base in, is it Utah? Is Utah the state? I'm trying to remember. Just, yeah, I think they're in Utah. Utah. Yeah, yeah, and, like seeing the base and then sell, seeing Delaware Lindo and being like, "Oh, okay." Yeah, I recognize him for sure. <laughs> it's like it's like something like this this level of like immediate actor recognition that you get that's kind of jarring at times. Well, also it be, just becomes fatigue at some point of every scene. You're like, "Oh, hey, it's so and so." Oh, hey, it's so and so. And by like 15 minutes into the movie, I'm like, "Yeah, like I get it." <laughs> it's there's going to be somebody in every single scene that I'm like, "Oh my god, it's him." Yeah, well, I mean, I think I also have that issue with with Howie Long in it because like especially now I find him so I like identifiable like as like a, an NFL newscaster. Um Yeah. I mean, at the time he was just coming off of his, his NFL career. So like, yeah, people knew him, but like he wasn't like on ESPN all of the time. So like seeing him in this and I'm like, oh, all right. Okay, all it's right. more like, oh, are you a Raiders fan? Then you'll know Howie Long. It wasn't just like, oh, you get just sports. Yeah, you'll know Howie Long. Yeah, have you heard of sports? <laughs> <laughs> and it explains why I didn't recognize him. <laughs> well, Nick, a, also, he, uh, he went to Milford, Massachusetts High School, and he was in the Hall of Fame for their football league. Um, um, well, we went to some, West Haven. Represent. <laughs> but we lived you in Milford, lived Massachusetts. <laughs> and he never stopped by. <laughs> um, so let's get into this movie. So I actually immediately like the opening to this thing of they keep cutting between this top down zoom on a boxing ring cut in with shots of Hale and Deacon's boxing in there of it just being like, OK, slow zoom down. And then all of a sudden it's just like everything's black except the ring and them moving and then it'll cut into just like them having like one punch and then it cuts back and then like a quick scuffle and it cuts back. And I think, I don't know if it's just like a very, I don't want to say heavy handed, but it's the script itself, the, <laughs> but the script itself, like it opens with a conversation as they're fighting of John Travolta explaining like, oh, the rope-a-dope. That's how Ali took the title from Foreman. He beat him with a rope-a-dope. Don't you remember? I don't remember what day of week it is. That's right. Everyone thought all these arms had run out, but he's on empty. But he's just setting Foreman up. And it's all this stuff that even in the beginning, never seeing the movie before, you'd be like, oh yeah, all of this is going to play into all the rest of this movie or play into the 
the climax of this film. Yeah, John John Travolta is like an an asshole in the first minute, <laughs> and not knowing the plot at all. Growing up, I've always seen the poster, and then I think I saw the ending where there it's like on a train or something, and that's that's my lifetime exposure to Broken Arrow. That's it. I had no idea what it was. So watching this and in that opening credit scene, just the way that John Travolta was just aggressively beating the shit out of Christian Slater, like, is he supposed to be the bad guy? Because they're making it pretty painfully obvious that this guy is going to be uh, some kind of loose cannon off the like renegade <laughs> type very, very soon. If he's a good guy, he needs more friends. I know. Watching, yeah. watching this opening sequence, I had two main thoughts. One. This could have been the main villain face off in a boxing film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it had the same tone. And also, that was the prettiest boxing match I've ever seen, where someone is getting literally pummeled to death and has no bruises, yeah. no blood, no spit. It's just, he's perfectly clean. I'm just like, wow. And neither one are out of breath that they're continuing to have a conversation as they're just yeah. like wailing on I'm each like, other. I'm like, Christian Slayer is getting the, like, absolutely pummeled <laughs> and he's just like oh no i look fine everything's great i'm just you know he got a mission in like five minutes yeah like i wrote in my notes deacons manhandles hail while teach him about fighting also neither one sustains damage <laughs> i was like man this is this is the worst beat down that also didn't matter to either person <laughs> These must be the softest gloves. <laughs> when I realized that they were both pilots, when Christian was like suiting up to go on his mission, I was expecting him to have like the swollen eye, <laughs> or at least really like the typical yeah, cut on his eye or saw like on his cheek to show like he was in a boxing fight. Because a boxing fight wound is always different than like I got into a fist fight earlier. It's always different. And he didn't have anything. I loved the like there's a scene directly after where he like adjusts his jaw like he had sustained like serious damage and he's just like he's like moving his jaw around like he had a dislocated jaw and he's just like you look fine I don't know what you like what's your deal he's like trying to like kayfabe like <laughs> that he was in a fight <laughs> I wanted to just cut to the briefing where it's like behind the back and then it cuts to the front. John Travolta's fine. And then Christian Slater's like eyes are puffy where you can't see them open. Just his entire mouth is just swollen. He has like the rocky cut under his eye because it had swollen over and he can't see. <laughs> We're going to put you in charge of flying these nukes. I can't see, boss. <laughs> it's fine. They're getting stolen anyway. What? <laughs> So, yeah, it was at this point in my notes that I said, wait a second, this song sounds familiar. And I started Googling it, and I was like, Hans Zimmer, come on, man. Um, so, yeah, we find that the two of them are friends, and he pays them money for losing the bet. And this $20 thing that kind of keeps going back and forth throughout it, which I didn't love just because it was kind of a, a weird thing of, oh, they always bet $20 going back and forth on I'll beat you and you beat me and yada, yada, yada. But they still carry it on into like after explosions happen, after double crosses happen. And it's still just like, oh, found this $20. At some point, I would be like, no, man, <laughs> I'm not betting against you. It's like, at what point do we stop the bet? Like, I bet you I'll kill all these people. Like, I don't really want to bet. <laughs> I bet we wipe Denver off the face of the map. And he's like, I no, I'm good, man. Uh, let's let's can we not do that? I mean, I don't think yeah. we need to raise the stakes with twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we get briefed on the mission, which evidently turns out to be they're doing a stealth mission with live nukes. Uh, which originally I was just wondering, like, oh, if it's just a practice mission, like, what's the point of them having live nukes in this? Which I guess makes sense. Of the goal was all of their team is supposed to be trying to capture them on radar or be able to detect them. And see if they're able to while they're in the stealth bomber with the nukes attached. So, like, it makes sense that it's just like a training exercise more so on their technology for tracking and not necessarily technology for the ship, probably, mm -hmm. or I, vice versa. I kind of feel like there's a better way, though. Or at least, like, don't give them the biggest nukes you have. <laughs> no, that wasn't biggest. That was just standard assortment oh because that remember, was the scary part i remember john travolta at one point or, or they, they had the exchange it was like oh like the the 60 megatons like no the 81 so i'm just like oh well all right you couldn't have given them different ones <laughs> like <laughs> it needs it needs to be a bigger kind i don't <laughs> it was no it, that's just the name of the missile so the actual payload was uh, called a b83 missile 
which is real. And that is a 1.5 megaton bomb. Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. So in terms of like, it's the same math measurement compared to like, you know, in computers when it comes to like kilobyte and megabyte. 15 was um, Hiroshima. And then it's over uh, 1,500 for this missile that they were carrying in terms of strength. It's a, it's a big ass bomb. And they got two of them. They don't just got one. They got two. They got two. I mean, couldn't they yeah. run the test with one? Maybe, probably. Also, couldn't they run probably. the test with just radioactive material if the goal was being able to detect radioactive material? I mean, I, I love the idea that they had two. It was like, if, if two would have worked, one would have worked. And if two would have worked, why didn't they give them the full payload of six that the uh, that the launch bay <laughs> clearly could have held? <laughs> it's like, no, just give them six. Why not? We need to test this. Yeah, we're, if we're, if we're going to give them two, might as well just give them six. It's a lot of radiation, boss. I'm feeling weak. <laughs> So, yeah, they get briefed on a stealth mission that they're going to go on, which I like how they're doing the stealth mission in uh, Utah. And I think it's Christian Slater, uh, Hale, that ends up saying, like, when the date comes, we have to go to war against Utah. We are really going to kick ass, you know? <laughs> Little do you know that soon you'll be exploding a nuke in Utah. <laughs> but underground, though, where it's safe. Yeah, I mean, well, when we get there. <laughs> In what looks to be the same mine that they have that race in Fast and the Furious 4? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the entire time I was like, wait a second, is this the mine from Fast 4? So yeah, so evidently the park rangers have gotten much stricter on campfires because we're introduced to a scene of a park ranger walking up on a couple uh, who have a campfire in the Utah wilderness and asking, hey, you know, you really can't have that. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. My wife has a cold. We're just trying to keep her warm. He's like, okay. And then just shoots the guy and then shoots the wife. Um, and then we're revealed that there might be kind of a diehard situation going on of there are people infiltrating all of this area as park rangers you know sam i like that you say that as uh the park rangers are strict as a joke but as we'll see later on no i think that was standard procedure for the park rangers <laughs> this is when i knew it was going to be one of those kinds of movies because after the guy shoots the like the, the guests you know in cold blood he falls down and he falls in the fire then off camera you can see him scoot off of the fire <laughs> I didn't see that. But then continue to be lit on fire because like when he dies, he falls and he dies in such a way that he it's clear he landed in the campfire. And then when the camera pulls back, you see the attacker like walking toward the camera away from the campfire. In the background, you can see the guy's legs and he's trying to scoot off of the campfire just to finally, you know, die off. Well, I mean, that could actually just be the character and not the actor of like, if I got shot and I was dying and I fell onto a campfire... If I'm going to die, I also don't want to die as I'm burning. Like, let me roll off this fire and then just die. With uh, five bullets in his chest, I guess uh, he really didn't want to go on that campfire. Well, yeah, but the lead gets hot. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's three phases of this. He's shot, he's on fire, and the bullets are hot. <laughs> hot so yeah, so that's piercing damage followed by uh, a... <laughs> fire and then heat metal spell. <laughs> So yeah, so the, the boys test their stealth plan against Delroy Lindo's crew to see if they can be identified during all of this. Um, Princess Daisy has become a park ranger and needs to check out sightings of another vehicle because she ends up getting the radio of, hey, we saw somebody else out there. Can you take a look into it? Because she's the only park ranger there. There shouldn't be other park ranger vehicles or park rangers. I like the that weird zoom in we get in on Deacons when they're both in the plane. And as they're talking and all of a sudden it's just like, one like the light coming across and one intense zoom in on his eyes just before we get into that slow-mo gunfight of deacons trying to take over the ship from hale and uh kill him or get him out of there because ultimately like they fight back and forth he can't kill him with a gun finally deacons just hits the eject button launches him out via parachute before he radios in that this is deacon hale's lost it i'm punching out and then ejects out himself. Yeah, it's it's an interesting little character moment for them, I find, because like there's that little bit of back and forth, and I'm, I, I begin to wonder like, are these guys friends or are they always on the verge of killing each other? And like, not for fun, but for real. Yeah, exactly. Like, because even 
even at the beginning when it's just like, oh, they're boxing. It's like, no, clearly it's, that's not something you do to a friend. And then afterwards, it's like, no, nah, it's still kind of like bit of a jerk about the whole thing. And then they go here and it's, no, he intended to kill him right out. So it's, I don't think these guys have ever been friends. That rivalry was really intense that it was kind of uncomfortable because it was more, I think they try to make it sound like Travolta had like the experience and the tenure and he's trying to like bring Christian Slater under his wing kind of thing. Or like you know they're not direct like like um, subordinate and commander, but it's enough that at least Travolta can teach him stuff. But that was just way too damn aggressive in the beginning. So when this whole like thing comes up and it's like they're, oh they're actually working together, it just kind of seemed weird to me. Yeah, I mean, and the exchange of like I was like oh are you like you know you're military for life, and John Travolta being like no you know flying doesn't mean what it used to me anymore. And Christian Slayer just being like, yeah, you just like the feeling of having the power of God. And I'm just like, <laughs> if you know this about him, like, that's worrying. <laughs> you are aware you're flying two nukes right now. <laughs> it's like, if you think that about your friend, you should be concerned about the, the safety of missions you fly with him. <laughs> and, and like, and just, you know, when when the the small, the fight in the cabin happens, like it's a it's a cool shot because John Travolta pulls out his sidearm, and uh, Christian Slater sees the reflection of John Travolta pulling, pulling out his gun. I don't think my first reaction in that situation was, "Oh, he's going to kill me." I would have thought, "Oh, oh, something's wrong." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, "Oh, did you hear a noise?" Yeah, it's like, "No, oh no, he's going to kill me." <laughs> oh, unless it's because they haven't been friends and they've literally been teetering that he's just like, "It's finally time." <laughs> and maybe that's what it is. That's what the relationship has been. It, it's been just him keeping tabs on John Travolta, who he knows is going to break at any time and just go on a rampage. <laughs> so. Yes, we we eject Hale. He goes launching off into the wild blue yonder. Uh, Deacons ends up ejecting, drops the nukes. He crashes, radios in to make it seem like Hale has been the problem. And that's when we get introduced to the Pentagon with Kurtwood Smith being briefed about the situation. Um, while Frank Whaley's character, Giles, ends up having the thought of all of this of, oh, maybe it's not an accident, or maybe there's something else going on, or maybe somebody stole these nukes and they're like, well, why would they steal nukes? There's plenty of easier ways to get a nuke. And it's like, yes, you can go buy a nuke anywhere, but only the U.S., if they lost one, would be paying ransom money to get it back. It's like... If they just go buy a nuke from some other country that just has extra nukes, like they're not going to be able to come back and resell it. I don't know the Kelly Blue Book value on a 81 or whatever it is. Also at this point, I yeah, this is when I realized that the soundtrack was still Scream 2. <laughs> um, and a unit goes out to reclaim the nukes uh, and it's empty. So that was the unit led uh, over by uh, the Vondi Curtis Hall that I had mentioned before and Howie Long's part of that group as well because their whole thing is to go out and capture this, which Kurtwood Smith now explains that it's a broken arrow. Roll credits. <laughs> Roll credits. It's funny, like, when we had that Pentagon scene with Giles, I honestly thought he was going to become a main character, because it felt like a very yeah. main character scene, where it's just like, oh, this nobody at the Pentagon, and then he speaks up, everyone's like, oh my god, you're right. Like, let's get him on a chopper and get him over there. Yeah. And then he has two more lines, the whole film. And I was like, if I didn't know John Travolta and Christian Slater were the stars of this film, I thought this guy was going to be the star of the film. Yeah. He reminded me of, like, um, what's his name? Nicolas Cage from The Rock. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was that same kind of role, like that, that presence in the room. Yeah. yeah, which I love Frank Whaley, and I was expecting like, okay, he's going to like, there's going to be more involvement or like, it's always going to be the, here's the action going on out there. But then there's always that guy in the chair or the guy back there that's like, I'm an analyst and I'm, I see the next step that's going on or the next step of the villain's plan. And I'm going to be radioing to Christian Slater and we're going to be figuring this out together. It's like, no, they just kind of are like, no, yeah, he might be right. Let's take a look at it. We'll figure it out. And then later, he ends up being with Delroy Lindo, uh, which we'll get to. But like, they're briefing Christian Slater and talking to him. And his only involvement is just, okay, well, I think it might be they're taking the bomb to here. Okay, well, I'm going to go out and handle it. Well, you know, I used to be, what was it, like a oh, lieutenant member of the ROTC, ROTC yeah. at Yale. And he's like, I wish I was going with you. 
well, you're not. And that's it. He's I really, just out of it. I really felt like he should have. Like, I, I honestly felt like, he, like, all right, guys, we're going to fly you out there. And he's going to be like the fourth in, in like the whole the whole movie, yeah. like the big pursuit. But it was just like, oh, you you have a point about this letter. We're going to send everyone. Let's get you on a chopper. And then he gets there and it's like, all right, well, you, you were wrong. Just moving on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like man I got shafted it, it seems more like well frank we have you for a six picture deal here at mgm so <laughs> here's one can i have something a bit more than just the what guy from pulp fiction oh this is what you got okay little shaft. he's probably like don't send me out there john killed me once already <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah so kurtwood smith explains what a broken arrow is which evidently so the phrase a broken arrow is not necessarily the the theft of the nuclear weapon. That's an empty quiver. The broken arrow is a nuclear weapon accident that doesn't end up creating any sort of risk of a nuclear war. So that's real terminology too. Yeah, so technically this is which I I kind of hate how they have to create terms for the loss of a nuke and the loss of a nuke that doesn't create the risk of nuclear war. Um, how many times has that occurred behind the scenes that somebody's like, you know, we should probably just have a term for this, you know, shorthand. So I don't have to keep explaining this every time we lose a nuke to theft. You know, that's um, that's how we found the Titanic. Did you know that? Did we lose a nuke and somebody went down looking and they're like, oh my God, the Titanic. Yeah, they covered it up by saying they're looking for the Titanic. They went down. They found the nuke really quickly in a lot faster than the time frame that they were expecting. And they had all the equipment. And they're like, guys, the Titanic sank around here. You want to actually look for it? Okay. And they actually <laughs> found it. You want to look for it? You want to nuke it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that'll get at the surface, maybe. Let's finish what this iceberg started. <laughs> <laughs> the cover-up is that the Titanic sank from the nuke. Well, it can't go farther down, so if they nuke it, it goes up. It's the only way. Uh, so yeah, so Hale wakes up in the desert. No idea why he leaves the $20 under a rock, because he like finds the $20 still on him, and he puts it under a rock of like, Here, you got me this round. Which... <laughs> <laughs> getting cut off in traffic, or, you know, like, you leaving the salt... Uh, cover off the shaker and go to pour it out and the whole thing comes out. ah you stole the nuke <laughs> yeah i mean that's literally pretty much what it is of like you pulled a gun out of me we fought and then you launched me out of a stealth bomber you got me this time twenty dollars to you good sir which i would hold on to and give it to him in person if that's the case rather than just leaving it on a rock i would have loved if at the end of the movie when they're fighting he's like by the way deacons uh, four miles west, I left a $20 bill under a rock for you. What I would have loved if, if, like, if this was a more modern movie, I would love to see him, like, pull out his cell phone and be like, Venmo. It's like $20. <laughs> it's like, stealth bomber stolen. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> but he Venmos with, like, location turned on, and Deacons is like, we got him. <laughs> <laughs> Dead within minutes. Chopper comes in. Uh, so yeah, so, uh, Terry ends up finding him, stops him. Ends up disarming her. She gets the upper hand after firing warning shot. Um, and then he gets the upperest hand by then uppering her hand. So what does this solve? They're now friends, I guess, because he could have killed her, but he didn't. Also, what is up with Utah Park Rangers and just pulling guns on people because they're not facing you? <laughs> <laughs> it's like his only, his, a, only, his only crime was standing there. <laughs> that was a tad bit aggressive and he is in full military uniform. So it's just like, and there's... Like, one thing I didn't realize through the entire movie, until, like, one of the last lines in the, the whole thing, the main character, Christian Slater, and Samantha Mathis, the park ranger, they never exchange who they are or names at any point in this entire movie until the last line. So you would think yeah. that this guy is, like, looks military. You would at least think, like, where'd you come from? Like, it's just one of those, like, tropes of, like, this whole movie would have shaped out so much differently if just... Hey, Christian, why don't you say you're a downed fighter pilot? I mean, she she had the context clues. Like, she saw a plane. She saw a parachute. She <laughs> a saw, chair with a parachute. She, she saw a military man. And her first instinct is, I'm going to shoot this guy. You can Get tell off us, my can, land. You've got a Red you Dawn can tell situation. You America. <laughs> <laughs> if he was invading, I don't think he'd land in Utah without a plane. 
park's closed. Get out of here. I can ask you again. Becomes a weird Die Hard kind of film. I just wanted her to kill one person to that and say, park's closed. <laughs> also, I love the standard issue sidearm for the park ranger, which which is just like, I, I, I don't know the actual firearm, but looks like, like a Colt 45. It's just this massive revolver that you could bludgeon <laughs> someone to death with as easy as shoot them. Hey, Utah parks. <laughs> Got to be tough. Got to stop those people camping with fires. <laughs> Always tell them it's not loaded. <laughs> Which he doesn't at least like recognize a weight difference of the gun being loaded or not loaded, or unless he just assumed like whatever he didn't intend to kill her anyway, so it doesn't matter to him whether it's loaded or not loaded. Yeah, I, I love they stand. They get into a standoff, and she's like, "Oh, it." You know, I'm not in any danger. The gun's not loaded. It's like, well, then why are you in a standoff? Why don't Why don't you just kill him with your knife if you know it's not loaded? <laughs> <laughs> it's not loaded with bullets. <laughs> I found that nuke. I fashioned them into uh, six slugs. <laughs> six smaller nukes. We're all in the walking ghost phase right now, Hale. Um, so, yes. I didn't realize it until, like, towards the end of the movie of... They never introduced each other. Kind of weird, but sure. Evidently also, so he was in the, his military outfit, I guess supposedly, um, according to the trivia, Deacon's character, John Travolta's, ended up having to take off his military outfit once he turned out to be a traitor because the military didn't want him wearing a uniform and being a bad guy in the movie. That makes a lot of sense. I hadn't, I, I hadn't even really thought about the fact that he changed his wardrobe. Like, I noticed it. But, like, I was just like, eh. Yeah, like, I mean, it, it. at least it wasn't jarring. It makes sense for his character that it's like, okay, I'm done with this. I'd rather, like, he's all about being cool, I guess. <laughs> so, at least that makes sense. But I just found it, like, is it really that important that part of the stipulation is he's allowed to wear a military uniform until he's the bad guy, then take it off? Like, is this an iPhone situation? A villains can't have iPhones? Is that a real it thing? It is a branding thing. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know about that. Uh, Knives Out, the first one, was spoilers. Like, the whole thing with, like, the, the person that's, like, the who done it, you mm -hmm. can figure it out by the iPhone thing. It was spoiled because of that. And then afterward, he um, changed the way how the sequel was done so that people couldn't use the iPhone trick. Because mm -hmm. it's in a world where no one has iPhones. Just Everyone's all runs on Nokia bricks. Non denominational phones. <laughs> Pineapple phones. So, <laughs> so the rescue team, the army unit, is still hunting the nukes on radar. The ones that this is with Howie Long's unit and all of them. The chopper pilots get taken out by an old shoelace trick. Evidently, they were the ones waiting to take the unit back. Um, one guy parks, walks in front of the driver's side door, is talking to him, and then all of a sudden says, "Oh, my shoelace!" And he goes to bend down, and the guy that was in the driver's side behind him has already kind of aimed and just opens fire on them. So luckily, nobody is able to evidently see beyond this man's frame because there was another guy in the vehicle on both sides. To me, if you're readying a weapon and you're standing in front of me, I can still see there's something going on behind you. And in a military environment, I don't think I would just be like, "This is all normal." Which kind of continues throughout all of this movie involving the military of just guys. <laughs> two two armored fun. two armored Humvees pull up to a military helicopter. Yeah, this is normal. I'm just going to vaguely gesture with my my firearm and be like, "Be on your way." <laughs> yeah, parks close. But like, <laughs> as they're doing, like especially if the guy is talking to me and like purposely standing in front of the driver's side, and I just hear and see something going on behind him. In the driver's side door, I'm like, mm, I don't think we would just hang out for a while. But for the purposes of this, it happens. We move on. It's true. There's, uh, there's so, yeah, a but, lot of suspension of disbelief when when you when yeah. you when you think about the whole plan in general. It really never should have worked. But but movies. <laughs> so yeah, this is a very movies uh, kind of heist. I mean, it's the same thing of like, okay, so in the beginning of Die Hard, and the guys just walk in and whatnot. If at any point throughout this we had either better security or if we had maybe any security guards who are aware of staffing or badges, like certain things need to happen for 80s and 90s action movies to be 80s and 90s action movies. And I'm just willing to go along with it. So 
Now, Deacon wanders out in slow-mo and confirms he's working with the bad guys, which I love John Woo. John Woo loves slow-mo. There's going to be a lot of slow-mo in this film. Uh, Howie Long is revealed to be a bad guy after shooting his own team, after also shooting at his own bad guys. When his unit is attacked down at the bottom of the cliff, uh, he is one of the ones that runs out and starts firing up at the shooters, and they have to scramble and get away from him. And then you find out that he's one of that group anyway. I can't picture... (laughs) When he pulled out the gun and he cocked it, I'm like, oh my god, he's going to shoot him in the head. And then he like ducks down like, oh, cool, he's on our side. He's like, hey man, I'm sorry. And then he points and like, shoots the guy in the chest like, oh, I thought he was just going to cap him right in the head. <laughs> I mean, it's it, he kept us guessing. I had no idea what side Howie Long was on. I mean, he shot at his own guys, then he shot his own guys on the other side, then he shot at his own guys back on the other side. So at this point, it's just... I think Howie Long's on Howie Long's side. I was like, Howie Long wants the nukes for himself. He has his own plan. He's running. (laughs) So, yeah. So at this point in my notes, it's just everybody's double-crossing everybody. So Howie calls into Delroy and uses an electric razor to convince him the nukes are open. This is Evan Kelly, sir! Go. Chief Rhodes is dead! They're all dead! What the hell happened? It's the nuke! It's open! It's wide open! God, what am I going to do? Which, I guess, works um, as far as that. You would think they would have some sort of tracking or some sort of awareness on if the nuclear device was opened. Unless it's just literally they're expecting, yeah, there was just a tear in the bomb when it dropped and now all of a sudden it's just leaking radioactive material but I know, that's, at that point you just write utah off yeah that, that's what i love about like when they they go back to like the base in utah and they're like it's like oh did you check the area for radiation and they're like yeah we're not getting any readings it's like well it's it's probably not open then <laughs> like you, you you checked for radiation and there was none so Yeah, well, plus the whole thing of when eventually it goes off in the mine and they're like, yeah, don't worry, it's all contained in the mine. I am not any sort of nuclear expert. I also don't know how great it is for that surrounding area for a nuke to be launched in a mine that does it then expand out. So they think that it's open. Meanwhile, Terry, she radios in uh, while a helicopter swoops in after them and the helicopter destroys her truck. Hale saves her. Um, clearly now they know like we're marked somebody's coming after us Hale asks for a gun and I thought he was going to do something impressive with it and instead he just runs after the helicopter wildly firing shots after it and then runs back to her and he's just like do you have any more ammo and then proceeds to shoot the helicopter and kill the pilot from there but it was just funny that it's just here give me your gun and then he just wastes an entire like set of bullets on it yeah, I was kind of impressed that he was able to snipe out the guy with a revolver pistol from like 300 yards out. <laughs> That's why he needed two sets of bullets. Also, the the level, I think this might have been one of the first times we were introduced to, well, I guess not the, the main plane crash, but like the level of explosions we were going to be seeing in this film. Like, <laughs> hi. I love how every time the helicopter even touched anything, it just started exploding at that point. <laughs> it's it, it very much reminds me of like Goldeneye in the N64, where even if you shot the chairs, the chairs exploded. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's just, it, it's just like if, if it's not giving off sparks or fire, it doesn't belong in this film. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he shoots the helicopter pilot. That goes down, that blows up. Deegan's is fuming over the helicopter pilot dying, or well, rather the helicopter going down. Uh, and then he just dresses down his investor but for being too hostile, uh, because this is where we have, uh, I think his name is Pritchett. The entire time, Pritchett is so annoying. Like, he's clearly the one that is putting up something towards this project, but that's Bob Gunton, who... John Travolta exercises a lot of patience with this man throughout the beginning of this film um, that it does not surprise me when he eventually kills him. You assured me everything would go smoothly. Everything is going smoothly, I assure you. Our merchandise is not where it's supposed to be. It's right down there, Mr. Pritchett. Because to me, if you have an unstable guy who is in the military who has tried to kill his own partner and steal nukes all for this purpose... 
I don't think I would be constantly goading him and yelling at him the entire time for how incompetent he is and how much money he's wasting, especially when you don't have anybody with you. You don't have a crew and he's there. He has a crew and you're there. So I feel like it's really a a fish out of water situation for the villain accountant of sorts. I'm also trying to think of like, how much money did he, like, he keeps saying, like, you know, me and my investors, we really put a lot into this. And, like, I'm just not seeing it. Because you got you got two <laughs> retired army Humvees and a civilian helicopter. Like, it just that just doesn't seem, like, you could rent the helicopter, probably. Well, they had the second helicopter. There was a second helicopter? I thought there was just one. Well, the one that blew up when he shot it, and then the one at the end of the movie that blows up when it blows up. Oh, but that it's was like- the military one. The, the hazmat team was in. Yeah, people everywhere. Oh, no, there was one on the train that they had set up. Oh, that's right. There was a second one. Okay, so he rents two And I think the train wasn't their doing. The train yeah, was just the train. Just the train. So he, he rents two <laughs> helicopters, and he gets two retired Army Humvees from, like, the, the Army Depot. <laughs> like an auction. <laughs> like an, an, an auction. Like... I don't know. That, that doesn't feel like more than like a hundred grand. I don't. Like, I'm just trying to think. Like, it doesn't feel like you have that much skin in the game. It's like the whole robbing a bank thing. Like, the penalty for robbing a bank is pretty fucking high. And what a lot of people don't know is like banks don't have a lot of money, so it's really not worth stealing from a bank for the penalties incurred if you were able to like, you know, at least like, is the risk worth the reward? How much could he possibly be getting for these two nuclear weapons? I mean, John Travolta it, was going to buy 5% of Volvo, so... I got a broker in Stockholm that's going to buy me 5% of Volvo. And for the rest of my years, I'm going to live off the dividends. Happy in the knowledge that I'm helping to make the safest automobiles in the world. <laughs> Which is the, the <laughs> dumbest, the dumbest thing I've ever heard a villain say. That, what are Don't. you doing this for? five percent of volvo that live on those those dividend checks and all i can think of is like yeah until they have the next stockholders meeting and they decide not to give out dividend checks anymore and choose to reinvest it in the company then you're done john like i don't know what to do (laughs) then he has to sell his five percent in volvo and he's going to be one of the guys buying GameStop 20 years later. Like then this this just becomes big daddy where he's, we suddenly see him in a supermarket (laughs) putting dents in cans of beans because his stock (laughs) went down three points. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I mean at the next stockholder meeting, do they just say, excuse me, has anybody who owns stock on this meeting right now committed some sort of gross U S treason of a nuclear weapon, they don't necessarily have to continue doing business with him at that point. I'm sure that would be easily trackable. Well, Tim, I don't think that's uh, brought up during any of the board meetings. It's like, before we continue, has anyone committed mass federal like fraud or any kind of like severe federal offense in a room full of like insider traders? Everyone just looks around the room like, no, nope, we're good. Carry on. <laughs> True, because he didn't say that to Christian Slater, I don't think. I think he was just talking to, uh, it might have been Howie Long or something. Because I don't think he was talking to Christian Slater when he explained the Volvo situation. Because that would be ridiculous for him to be like, I'm buying 5% of Volvo. And then Hale gets out and just calls Volvo and is like, there is a man. If he buys 5% of your company, give him my name. (laughs) Or rather, give us his name. I mean, I kind of want to see that movie. <laughs> Just John Travolta owns 5% of Volvo, like, has to deal with, like, internal politics when, like, the board tries to buy him out and it just becomes, like, a semi-Elon Musk story. Which I like how, um, at one point, when he explains the Volvo situation, he's like, and then I'll rest easy with the knowledge that I make the safest cars in the world. What product placement is this for <laughs> Volvo? And it's like... Yeah, after I rob this thing and ransom a nuclear weapon, I'll buy parts of Volvo. And then at least I know we're doing good for the world by making safe vehicles. It's it's like that's living that's the dream? Own, owning shares in Volvo? Like that's what everyone should aspire to. Also, did Volvo pay for this? Like this seems it seems like a lot of attention to pay on them for for like for like no no real particular reason. I mean, they're good cars. I'm not going to I'm not going to say anything bad about a Volvo, but like it just seems odd <laughs> like to pick an automo- like an automobile company to be like, that's what I'm going to do with my money. 
Or, I'm just curious now, what was Volvo even worth back in 1996? Well, I mean, right now they're like 200, 230 a share. So like, but that they've seen some significant growth lately. So, I mean, I don't know what they were back then. Or maybe that was just like a character point for John Travolta of being like, yeah, he's out of his mind. <laughs> yeah, he's done he almost, no research. Almost, he had... Like at some points, it almost seemed like a precursor to his role as Charlie Wax in um, what the hell's the movie House of Wax from Paris? No, from Paris with Love. <laughs> oh, 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 yes, yes, yes. Like it's like twenty years later, he's just finally unhinged. <laughs> so yeah, I have no idea specifically how much money Volvo was worth back in nineteen ninety six. I guess now it's a market cap of forty five billion in twenty twenty three. I don't know what it would have been back then, but I'm just picturing 5% of that. And now it's not just you get that 5% money there. You're then getting dividends based off of that 5% of the company in shares you've gotten. So I don't know if he would necessarily have enough money to just be like, I'll have a mansion out in some island that nobody will ever know about living the life of Riley. Like it might just be more so of, I will have a somewhere small off in a place they'll never find me and i will live a simple life and be happy um i mean honestly i feel like he wouldn't make that much money and when i think about it like he's 20 years in the air force his pension might have been better (laughs) yeah but the only thing is i think high treason prevents him from getting that pension (laughs) so like maybe he should have just retired and been like you know what this isn't working out for me i'm never gonna make colonel i'm just gonna retire take the pension if only the movie went a little bit differently so yeah so at this point this is when uh frank whaley's character giles ends up figuring out that the bombs weren't an accident or or actually a ransom play and Hale fills Terry in on everything that's going on and sends her away so this way he can go after the trucks alone because we now have the two Humvees uh, with one of them with John Travolta and Howie Long's crew and then the other one with the two nukes. To me, if we had two nukes that are very expensive and the whole point of this mission, put one in one truck, one in the other truck, because God forbid something happens to one of them, at least you have the other. Um, But... They put them both in one truck. She follows him anyway. (laughs) Truck one takes her hostage. And then Hale jumps in and shoots him. um, Which I like how he immediately takes the guy out. It's not like one of those things. uh, Put your weapon down or I'll shoot her. Or they go back and forth or anything. It's just he immediately just shoots the guy. Which is almost kind of refreshing in these action movies. Of we get it. We're going to do the whole scene. We're going to go back and forth. It's going to be put the gun down. And then there's going to be some secret or something like that. And it's just. Just shoot the guy. He's not going to react in time. See, that's that's that uh, non-John Woo cut. Probably in the original two hours. It, it probably went on for a while. <laughs> we got to learn about the guy driving the Humvee, what unit he was in, how long he nope. was serving. Static shot, 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> it's just like that one scene in House of a Thousand Corpses. We're just going to hold it for like 30 minutes. And then all of a sudden he just fires. So, also, as all of this gunfight's going on, I like how, like, John Travolta says it multiple times throughout the movie of, like, Would you mind not shooting at the thermonuclear weapons? Which, Nick, you know more about this than I do. Do you know if shooting the bomb is enough to detonate the bomb? Or is it kind of like C4, where shooting C4 does nothing? It needs an electrical ignition. Yeah, well, no, it's, 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 it's a chain reaction that creates the boom. I think they're more concerned at this point about um, damaging them. No, well, yeah, damaging and it causing like the because it does have shielding for the radiation that's in there. They're probably just trying to avoid that. Ah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, because in the film they they like make a point of saying that like oh they could be sitting in a fire and that thing won't go off. Yeah, he shoots it, starts leaking. Slater ends up getting Hulk powers. <laughs> the end of this movie <laughs> is uh. Leads to the interview with the vampire. <laughs> Hale hulked <laughs> out. Just fighting a uh, John Travolta Red Hulk. Which sounds ridiculous, but I would... Thousand percent. I'd pay $35 a ticket to go watch that. Um, so yes. So Hale makes a bomb with gasoline and a flare. And ignites truck two. 
Uh, that was pretty which, clever. I did like that a lot. It, it was pretty, which I like how she's like, did the military teach you that? And he's like, New Jersey. Trenton, New Jersey. Shout out to Trenton, New Jersey for teaching him how to make a Molotov with gasoline and a flare. So I feel like a lot of this movie all takes place in the following set of the mind. Because I feel like my notes just, I keep them by scene. And then at one point I just have the mine, the mine again, the mine trapped. We're still in the mine, in the mine for a while before ultimately getting out and getting to the train where it just becomes, here's 35 minutes of the train. This killed me a little bit only because of just the severity of the bomb and how it was set up. And like, we're going to set it off in the mine. I'm thinking, oh my God. Do you see the video I posted? Oh, over the comparison for the blast? Yeah. It's startling on how big that bomb is. (laughs) And that is not what happened in the movie. Yeah, because essentially the video you showed looked kind of like what ended up in this movie. And what was the the one in the video? The video was the same comparison of the, the size, but my complaint was the crater that it left behind was substantially smaller than what it should have been. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, also, I, I don't know how radiation works, but I feel like... Neither do they. But I feel like <laughs> radiation... I, I mean, I, don't, I know it was underground in a mine, but like, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like there's a very expansive distance that, that that amount of radiation would affect. And it was not as far as you could get in a Humvee in three minutes. It would have been self-contained. They would have been okay. But just the size of the blast and the shockwave alone, I don't think they could have gotten away within one minute. Mm-hmm. They were probably like not even like, like half a mile away, if that lets like fast as possible on foot being carried by a river within one minute. Yeah, no, they probably got like about half a mile. Give them the benefit of the doubt, one mile. When the bomb's radius of that is like five miles wide in the air, I don't think they got away in time. Now, what if they just dunk their heads under water before the explosion hits? I mean, or if they got into an old fridge. Or if they overturned a canoe. (laughs) The uh, putting your head underwater, I think, would have made it worse. Mythbusters did a thing about shock waves, and having anything in the water could actually make it worse. Right. Well, that's how depth charges work, right? They create a shock wave yeah. underwater that basically weaponizes the water. Yeah. Huh. Their body would have survived. The head would have exploded. Hmm. <laughs> well, that's a very important part of the body. <laughs> so. Hale tries to disable the nukes uh, before getting a call from Deacons, and Deacons explains that he changed out the circuit boards to uncoded circuit boards, so instead of disabling the nuke after inputting three wrong codes, it now armed the nuke for 30 minutes. Which I don't understand how that works, but it feels like that's not how that should work. <laughs> it's not, but it was a very good like movie moment where it's just like, ah, I got you, you think you got checkmate, but I actually checked you. Which I'm just like, I don't know what an uncoded circuit board is, but I feel like it doesn't do the opposite of what you want it to do i don't think that's like purpose. A, David, you just get them from walmart for like five <laughs> for ten dollars is it like a jailbroke nuke <laughs> yeah get them on ebay what if instead of 30 minutes it was instant mid call he's explaining it and he hears the bomb go off i'm like sitting there wondering and i'm like when did john travolta get access to the nukes where he could change out the circuit boards on them yeah because like beforehand he was a pilot unless like while they were on the flight getting ready he like at one point went back there and was like let me just tinker but i don't think it's something that is that easily accessible to be like oh i just un i removed all of the circuit boards of these nukes replaced them and then walked back up front in the plane we just get a quick scene of john travolta just soldering on top of the nuke (laughs) just waiting for the soldering (laughs) iron to heat up he's just like oh come on (laughs) you good back there yep i'm good Um, So yeah, so they decide to bury both nukes deep in the mine and hopefully avoid the whole problem from there. And he figures Deacon wants to get rid of one nuke just to prove they're willing to do it. They're crazy as they say they are for this ransom. Um, So it was part of his plan all along. Hale decides, fine, if one's going to go off, let's bury it deep in the mine with the other one. So both of them are going to either get destroyed or get caved in. And good luck, Deacon's on ever getting his ransom either way. So... Delroy and Whaley end up figuring out that it was Deacons and not Hale. So when the call came through before of like, oh, Hale's gone crazy. Um, he's lost it. 
they originally thought, oh, he lost it. They lost the nukes. That's what happened here. And then it turned into, oh, no, he went crazy and took over the nukes. And now they finally realize, like, no, Hale's the good guy here. Deacons is the one who did all this, which I like how they do this early enough in the movie that it's not constant misunderstandings of towards the end of oh he's trying to save the day but then the government is trying to stop him or like they're taking him out while he's trying to stop John Travolta like we've seen that a million times I like that they just got that out of the way so it's just oh no it's Hale's the good guy let's figure out what's going on here and we'll just back him up that felt very diehard in that sense yeah I I honestly I thought that they were going to pursue that narrative like it, it is it's 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 happened. Like we've seen it in a bunch of films, but like the fact that they brought it up, but didn't do anything with it. I was just kind of just like, Oh, okay. Because like we had the whole, we had that plane scene with Giles when he's like on his way and he's like, Oh no, I think it means something different. And I'm like, Oh, it's going to be one of these. And then they're just like, no, no. I'm like, okay. (laughs) All right. It's a way to take this. I mean, I don't, I don't mind because like I, I didn't want that story beat of like that, that added like invented drama. But I was just like, well, which even for that moment where they thought that, oh, it is Hale. He's doing this. It's never acted on. And there's nothing that's done that hinders Hale because of it. So it's just, man, Deacons, you throw out that Hale Mary of like, I'll do this one last broadcast. And then that way they'll go after him. They won't. (laughs) That will save you no time. That will benefit you in no way. He like has all these these plans upon plans, and like half of them don't matter or work. <laughs> I think that suffers from the cut content because it probably did. And then when mm-hmm. they realized runtime was going too long, they cut it down so that it went from it did work to it doesn't. Delroy Lindo sends three kill squads after Hale that he has to kill. And instead, we just get the scene. No, you're wrong. It's not Hale. It's Deacon. <laughs> a herd of assassins. Four Knights Templar brought back using a time machine. Man, those 45 minutes that got cut. I wonder if you ever got a director's cut of it. I wonder if that... I wish we did. I would watch the rest of this, a two-hour cut of this. So Deacons ends up changing the timers to 13 minutes instead of 30 and engages in a gunfight with Hale, uh, which, again, a lot of gunfire going off near nuclear weapons. But we end up getting Terry gets dropped on a henchman and... (laughs) <laughs> he ends up then getting to drop on her and hail tequilas his way over the hill to dual gun him down john woo style which i like how this is where i saw christian Slater. i'm like yeah if this was done back in the 80s he definitely would have had J- chow yun fat as christian slater's role just for the the dual guns light coming behind him running up over the hill and then jumping through the air firing both guns at the guy that's extremely hard boiled. I was taken aback that we didn't get any doves for that scene. But we got the only butterflies. reason I didn't like this movie. No, no doves. No doves. Well, they're trying to keep it realistic. And how do they explain a, just a pack of doves in the Utah wilderness? I mean, in Mission Impossible 2, we had doves in an underground bunker. Were those doves or pigeons, though? Oh, uh, I thought they were doves. I'm, I'm Which may- also, how do we have pigeons? <laughs> But still. <laughs> also, in Mission Impossible 2, we get motorcycle jousting. Um, that's a whole other thing. Someday. We'll get, we'll do a, a whole month of Mission Impossible movies. Um, so yeah, so a guy takes the pin out of the grade aid in the hungriest, most labored process ever. Because it was just like 18 seconds of this one guy just making like yummy noises as he's just trying to like fiddle and pull this out with his teeth um, before finally throwing it. And then Hale just grabs it and just throws it at Deacon instead. I, I also love that in this scene, we get the first glimpse of of, uh, of Christian Slater's daredevil-like uh, hearing that works exclusively <laughs> around grenades. <laughs> Where he's just like, I know that sound. That's the sound of a grenade pin. And it's just like so hyper-aware and and we see we see this again and like i think maybe like in two scenes later where he's just so acutely aware of the sound of grenades well i think also the thing that helped him is the sound of that guy <laughs> hungrily <laughs> chewing the metal for like 20 seconds before throwing it of just the <laughs> he's just trying to get a grip on this thing with his teeth so he can pull it out i, I just love that when he finally gets the pin out 
it is revealed that he is five feet away. Like I thought, <laughs> like because he gets shot in the arm, I think, and he like runs off, and then he like gets the grenade ready, and I'm like, oh okay, he's like he's like getting ready, he's gonna throw it, and then it's revealed that he's like just around the corner. Like he's at like mumbly peg distance with Christian Slater. <laughs> it's just like he is he so just chucks close. it at his feet. I was like, was he just going for a full on like suicide run at this point? I mean, he only got <laughs> shot in the arm. Like he's probably going to be fine. He eats a lot of garlic. He's bleeding out quick. <laughs> he's like, oh, I take blood thinners for my heart condition. <laughs> I'm on borrowed time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Yeah, so he throws it at Deacons. It caves in part of the wall, and now we get the the f- cool thing of the conversation on both sides of the cave in as they're talking. And actually, that reminds me. Yes, he specifically tells Hale in this scene. After this, I'm gonna buy five percent in Volvo and rest with the knowledge that we make the safest cars in the world. So he literally tells Hale. I mean, he has to just. It has to be that he assumes that Hale will die down there. But Hale really could have just left at this point and not gone back for the nuke and just been like, Volvo, uh, we need all your records if there's a guy who all of a sudden comes in with a very large cash purchase. Um, and then we will send the United Nations on him. It's when he gives this line of like, I'm going to buy 5% in Volvo. I start to wonder that I'm like, just I don't think Deacon has a real plan. I think he just wants to blow up some nukes. Like this does not. This is more of like a deranged kind of. I'm just fucking with you. He had all these plans upon plans, and I think he just wanted to blow up the nukes. Like I, I, I'm fine. The the longer it goes on, it's like I have a harder time believing that he had any ulterior motives. Like even when in one of the earlier scenes, he's talking to like the the main investor who's kind of running the operation, and he's like, you know, and if they pay the ransom, and he's like, what do you mean if? And it's like I nah, I think he's <laughs> he's hoping they don't. <laughs> I mean, probably he so he plays unhinged so well. I love John Travolta as a villain, but it would have been great if he's like, "I'm going to take that money. I'm going to put twenty percent in Hollywood Video," and you're like, "Oh no!" <laughs> <laughs> Just like four years later, Deacon's back out there, and he's like, "We got to get more nukes." <laughs> or like he just picks like a really weird car company. He's like, "Going to put all of this right into Mercury, <laughs> into Geo Lancers." <laughs> Or if what if it was like all popular things is like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get 10% in Pokemon stocks and Beanie Babies. And you're like, actually, you'll be rich for a while on one of those. Yeah, yeah one, one of those might do pretty well. It's hard to say. My son got into this magic game that's with trading cards. I'm going to I'm gonna yeah. dive heavy into that. John Troll is just like, I, I, you know, I've, I've already found it out. I found, you know, a 10 out of 10 rated of the power nine. Like, let's go. <laughs> It's just all of these really niche things that he just takes all the nuke money and invests in. It's like, oh my god, he's like some wizard. We're going to take all of this. There's this thing that's getting me. It's this online book company called Amazon. <laughs> I'm just going to get it on the ground floor of it. Oh my god, Deacons. <laughs> so, yes. Um, Howie drops two grenades down the shaft, which, as you said... Christian Slater's Daredevil powers hear that. They dodge away in time, caves the elevator shaft. They get away, but they're stuck down there. But not for long, because they literally get out in the next scene. Yeah, I don't know how many mines just have other exits. I mean, I, I know they end up getting out because there's, like, the explosion that knocks them into the underground river. But, like, the fact that they're like, oh, there's, like, this other way that we can go. There's an access tunnel and all of this. And I'm just like, I don't know if that's it's normal in mines. The other thing with a lot of the underground nuke detonations was like they put it in deep, like 2,000, 3,000 feet underground. I don't think they were that deep. So I think the explosion would have breached the surface. But I mean, I don't know. Oh, that's a good point. If they're like, because I think they did say like 2,000 feet, that elevator ride itself is like 20 minutes. Yeah, it's not exactly like the same elevator that you would take the. Empire State Building, where it gets you from the ground floor to the top in less yeah. than like five minutes. Like that is a a very long time out of service elevator. Now we're seeing the scene of like there's five minutes left on the bomb, and they're just like looking at their watches on the elevator, like <laughs> nervously. <laughs> That's the their elevator feet. of an hourly worker. <laughs> <laughs> like the miners who use that were not salary. Yeah, they have the punch out station at the top of the elevator. So like, yeah. <laughs> they weren't unionized, so they had to. Uh, you know, actually, it was a fast elevator. 
Terry leads them out through a waterway, through a series of tunnels. Um, and then we go back to Deacon's with Howie Long in the car with Pritchett. And I don't know why autocorrect did this, but I'm reading my notes and I was trying to figure out what my thought was. Because I say, Deacon's finally kills Pritchett because he's a pain nanny. <laughs> and I don't know where I was going with this, um, because that's clearly not the end of my thought. But he kills Pritchett. Maybe it was a pain in the ass. I don't know. But he hits him in the throat with a flashlight and finally kills him just because he's still complaining after all this time. And then Terry and Hale make it out. But I like the pettiness of Deacons that before they kind of escape and leave, Deacons blow smoke on Pritchett's corpse because he complained earlier about him smoking. That's like a weird running gag through the whole thing, too, because like their commanding officer back on the military base said the same thing. Like, did you get promoted, sir? Because I don't recall you being able to smoke in my room. He's like, oh, sorry, sir. And then he, like, as a badass, like, just puts it out, like, in his hand. He's like a sociopath in this whole movie. It's, it's <laughs> like, the more I think about it and, like, I'm now remembering scenes. And I was like, there's a lot of warning signs that there's something severely wrong with him. <laughs> yeah, after the boxing fight, I knew, like, there's something weird with this guy. And then when they did the thing and he, like, puts the cherry out in his fingertips, I'm like, okay, this guy is definitely a psychopath. Yeah, that's, like... You don't do that ever. There's, there's like the military heist movies where it's like it's cold and calculated and like, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm this, you know, selling it off to the Russians and make this money. And he's just he just his nothing makes sense. Like nothing about it makes sense. Like he's a lead villain who has the energy of every heist movie where there's always the one guy that they're like, can we trust him? Yeah, my buddy knows him. He's good. And he's the loose cannon that ends up getting them all killed. <laughs> Camera looks over to him. He's putting out a cigarette on his tongue. But yeah. he's the one in charge of the project. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the loose cannon is the one running the heist this time. And, and, and Which, we seeing all this and talking about it now i think really gives credence to nick's explanation of he never intended to sell that second milk <laughs> no matter how this went at the end of the day he was blowing that second nuke. i mean the fact that the first nuke was even if you tried not to arm it you were going to arm it <laughs> and then the second one he had he had rigged to a remote control already <laughs> It was just like, no, these were never getting sold. Well, I'm just glad it wasn't a dead man switch, because then it's just like, bud, you had an end game on this. <laughs> you weren't selling them a nuke that's on a dead man switch. Okay, the money cleared. Hold this forever. Gotta go. <laughs> what's, the, what's the blast radius on this? Oh, like six miles? Oh, well, this dead man switch is going to work out real great. <laughs> Uh, Deacons realizes after he kills Pritchett that he has never killed anyone in person, which I thought was kind of a nice touch with all of this of they both. I mean, it's even the same case with later on um, when Slater ends up killing somebody or uh, she ends up killing somebody and she's like, oh, like that's a first. And he's like, yeah, for me too. Even here when he says, yeah, I've always killed people like via plane drops or things like that. And he's like, I've never actually killed somebody like that I'm aware of face to face, which I guess applied in the nineties and applies now of the technology of war, but like it, he takes it just as well as Christian Slater does later that it makes me wonder like how twisted is he too, that he's just like killed a bunch of guys. Yeah. I'll make a one liner. Gotta go. You've just killed your first person. Could be just adrenaline at that point. It'll hit him later. <laughs> <It's> closed. <laughs> <laughs> just, the park is closed uh so yes so also when the first bomb goes off the chopper that is now has deacons and howie long dead to rights ends up getting knocked out due to the emp and it ends up crashing and exploding and then deacons explains what an emp is again <laughs> uh it's fucking cracked up here shockwave took down a damn chopper SEMP, electromagnetic pulse. Nuclear bass sends it out for miles. Everything electronic shuts down, including choppers and radios. <laughs> where EMP, is it? Where electromagnetic is it? pulse. I give them credit, though. There's not many times where it actually happens, and then they explain it. Usually it's the lead up to, and then we already know what's happening. Which I get to reuse that clip from our favorite tropes episode of A Rule of Thirds. We were talking about... Every time there's an EMP, somebody's going to sit down and explain what an EMP is to everybody. I like how Deacons gives that little excited speech to Howie Long about, like, he's just so jazzed about 
got him with an EMP. Here's what an EMP is. Isn't it great? Which I like how also, none of the radiation has leaked out from the blast, says Hale. Um, so now evidently he is a nuclear expert and also a butterfly expert. Um, as he tells her, it says in the manual, if there's butterflies outside after a nuclear blast goes off, you're totally safe. Totally um, safe. <laughs> which... Like, I get he's making her feel better, but I just laughed at that. That it's like, yeah, I don't think that's it's like the, the canary manual. trick in the mines. It's like, just release butterflies. Are they still alive? We're good. <laughs> so they give Jace after Deacons and they end up splitting up at this point, which Deacon sends his ransom for $250 million back to the, the U.S. group. Hale ends up getting rescued. Terry ends up going on to try to stop the nuke because now we're getting involved with the the other trucks getting to the train and all of this from here. So he gets rescued. He asks to go back and save Terry and stop the nuke. And I like this where this is where Delroy Lindo like explains the whole thing of you understand that that's going to be a court martial that's breaking orders, all of this stuff. And he says, OK, I'm going to break orders and just let you go do this. Here's all the stuff that we're going to need to figure out and just let's go back out. It's refreshing to have them not fight him on things and it's just like, okay, let's just work together as a team, put a plan together, and let's just go back out and get this handled. Um, rather than always the, he's the one guy who bucks the rules and he goes out and they're going to argue with him. It's just, no, that's fine. Let's just all get on a helicopter and we'll go shoot him. So Whaley then informs us that he was a lieutenant um, in Yale uh, in the ROTC and says, I wish I could be out there with you. And that's it. Uh, they find a train track that he could be using, however, because the whole thing of him leaving certain clues earlier and they realize that he did it on purpose and Deacons is trying to throw them off of thinking like, oh, he's going to go to um, the, the hospital up there and leave it with the radiology department. So this way it can't get tracked because it'll get confused with the other radiation tech and all this stuff. And they realize that there's another train track that he's going to be operating on. And then Hale figures out he's been tricking them and he has to be headed elsewhere. And he's like, ah, the old rope-a-dope, which is a callback to when he was actually getting rope-a-doped earlier in the film. I don't really know how this is a rope-a-dope now. I also don't really know if he was getting rope-a-doped in the original because like the rope-a-dope is like lulled them into a false sense of security. Like, oh, they're winning. And then you, <laughs> no. you're really not, but you're controlling the fight. But in the boxing match... Deacon was just destroying him. There was no need <laughs> uh, for a the rope old rope We were pouring it pounds four years of math out of your brain. I, I did thought that um, Christian Slater was going to win that boxing fight because he's like, you know, like, oh, you know, talking about the boxing is great. It's like, you know, I was always afraid of Bruce Lee. I thought he was going to completely turn the whole match around, but that's when Travolta just haymakers him and he knocks him to the floor. Well, originally I thought he was going to be like, that's why I'm a fan of Bruce Lee. And then just like kick him and then just be like, oh, so you won by not playing the same sport that you went in. in. But I want it to be like one of those Kung Fu hustle kicks that like comes in out of frame. At, like a weird angle. <laughs> <laughs> it just like kicks him from the back of the head. <laughs> it's just like army of darkness when the, the fingers come in from out of frame. It's just like. Four kicks coming in at different directions. Hale finally used the dark hado. Um, so, <laughs> so Deacons gets to his train and unleashes the third wave of men um, that he has because he just, every time he loses some, it's just like in the next scene, another truck comes in of just like replacements. Terry gets the drop on the bomb nerd guy who introduces himself as Max, advises he was a Navy SEAL, and then gets bludgeoned to death with a hammer. Such a weird scene of like this kind of guy with like a ponytail or whatever and glasses and she gets the drop on him and then he's like, my name is Max. You may think I look nerdy, but I was a Navy SEAL <laughs> and then, then proceeds to like fight her and then he she throws a hammer at his head and just caves it in and he just dies. It's just it just reminds me of like probably the one and only episode I've ever seen I've ever seen of Walker, Texas Ranger. <laughs> where the walker is tracking a, a former navy seal who like commits a murder and like at the end like he finally confronts him he's like you never take me down i'm a navy seal and he's like well i'm a texas ranger and he just like <laughs> destroys the and navy you seal see the four <laughs> kicks come from out of <laughs> just destroys him and i'm like i don't know if that's how that fight would go but all right <laughs> 
Hey, I don't know that Texas Ranger training. If it's anything <laughs> like the Utah Park Rangers. <laughs> I mean, Utah Park Rangers, they're trained to just shoot. Just shoot. <laughs> I'm a Navy SEAL. I'm a Texas Ranger. And he fires a rifle into his <laughs> chest. <laughs> I felt like she carried the gun, too, and it was just for rattlesnakes. It wasn't for people. <laughs> yeah, I don't think she uses it at any point on anyone. Because it's like she always ends up... She gets the drop on people a couple times, but it always ends up being like she gets the drop in a fist fight and then usually ends up getting beat, which I like at least this point. It's like she's not a damsel. She actually kills him. Because um, yeah. I... I was glad to actually see her be able to do something in this movie that isn't just waiting for Christian Slater to come. Uh, yeah. So Terry gets caught by deacons. So she ends up getting to, <laughs> I say she is forced to set the nuke at gunpoint in a weirdly sexual scene because it's like the this whole gunpoint thing of moaning and hitting buttons or something like that as he's having her fill the whole thing out and then we get a very quick raymond cruz giving stats on bomb deaths back at the pentagon from every movie in the 90s and 2000s and breaking bad and whatnot but again it's just like at this point we're fatigued from oh it's that guy that he pops up for a second i'm like i didn't even say his name out loud i just thought in my head of like oh it's raymond cruz so terry escapes and hail helicopters in to save her. Don't worry, Lindo's helicopter slices up the hostels with the blades after oh, saying, cool. let's give these guys a haircut. <laughs> My I'm God. A little off the top. <laughs> yeah. Like, asking, can you imagine your commanding officer ask, making a joke like, let's give these guys a haircut, and then commanding you, lower the blades and slice these men apart. Like, <laughs> it's... I think there was a lot of war crimes committed throughout Broken Air. <laughs> it's like, sir, we didn't we didn't need to do that. Uh. <laughs> You're carrying non-lethals. I know. Uh, so <laughs> he gives those men a haircut. Uh, Hale diehards a guy by dropping his gun and then grabbing Terry's out of her back pocket and shooting him. And Delroy like and his that. chopper get blown up, unfortunately. It was very sad. Wanted Delroy Lindo to live. I thought that was stupid, though, because that's what the gas leak, right? Uh, no, that that oh, was the chopper that's yet. on the train. Yeah, this was just they start firing at the chopper. They shoot him in the shoulder. And it was just, yeah. I guess, the the panic of shooting at the helicopter for a man in the military. He wasn't even paying attention to what was <laughs> yeah. going on. He was looking at everything except what was directly in front of him. So, yeah, for a man in the military as a chopper pilot doesn't get shot. From what I recall, it's just they're firing at the chopper, and he just drives into the ground and blows them both up. Which, bummer. <laughs> I forgot about this. So a guy makes a, this is where you get off comment, before getting thrown off himself. <laughs> it's like you had that line backwards, I think. <laughs> I forgot why I wrote it, and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh yeah, one of the henchmen is like, this is where you get off. And then he gets chucked off the train himself. And then Deacon's escape chopper gets booby-trapped and destroyed um, after a very tense series of cutting to Deacon's, cutting back to the guy's eyes in the helicopter, cutting back to Deacon's, cutting back to the guy uh, of him saying, like, don't turn on the power. And then because they ended up unloading the fuel lines earlier, it's leaking, he ignites, it blows up, his backup helicopter is done. I didn't, I didn't like that segment. It, I don't know what jet fuel smells like or helicopter fuel, but you would just think that Maybe I guess with everything else that was going on, he didn't smell anything weird. But with the amount of fuel that was leaking out, you would think he would have kind of realized that leading up to it. Here's the thing. The helicopter pilot had COVID, but they didn't have that in the cut. So that's in the two-hour director's cut. He had long COVID. He'd, he'd it. gotten over it a couple months ago, but yeah, still had it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, rest in pieces. Meanwhile, Deacons is like, oh, I heard my one of my guys <laughs> ended up having this disease. I'm going to invest 5% in Moderna um, <laughs> and once we get back from this nuke thing. So, yeah, like they end up blowing that guy up. Deacon sets the bomb for five minutes. Fuck them if they can't take a joke. Which, like you said, he is unhinged. I really think at this point he never intended this to happen or for this to get sold. If he's willing to just be like, you know what, now I'm just angry. Let's just set the nuke and I'm just going to blow myself up and everybody with me. John Travolta in this, like, Deacons is very Joker-esque. 
Oh, absolutely. Of, That's a great way to describe him. Yeah. Of the, I have a bunch of plans while having no plans. And then you never know what the actual truth is, what's actually happening. He's just making stuff up. And then at the end of the day, he's willing to take himself out to take everybody else with him um, if they can't appreciate it. Yeah, I, I love like as his plans start to fail, like even like earlier in the film where they lose the first helicopter and they're like, oh, it must have hit the canyon wall probably. And he's like, yeah, maybe or something. And he's like, do you, you not concerned? about anything <laughs> he's just like nah, nothing matters whatever let's Which go makes sense if he had like okay at first you're like okay it's because he has the backup plan to the backup plan but more as farther it goes on it's more like no it's because at the end of the day he was probably just gonna set this off anyway so it's like our helicopter's down okay the humvees are destroyed <laughs> he got me there oh they escaped the mine yeah <laughs> he's a wily one. Oh, they blew up our second chopper yeah <laughs> It's like, yeah, I think he just intended to blow this up. Yeah, the only the only time he was ever actually affected by anything is when Christian Slater was like, I'm going to bury them both. And then he's like, oh, now I care about something. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, not my second bomb. That's my train bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Need that one for later. <laughs> so during this scuffle... Hale swing kicks Howie Long off the train, and we get the Howie scream. So not originated in this, it was just called the Howie scream because of Broken Arrow with Howie Long. So originally it was from a 1980 film called The Ninth Configuration, and so it was the first one to have it. Not necessarily what it was named after, as we said. Steve Sandor was the actor in that movie that ended up having that scream, even though he didn't actually do that scream. Evidently, it was uh, supposedly off like a sound effect collection called just like the, the title of the track was Screams 3, Man, Gut-Wrenching Scream and Falls into Distance. So it was just a stock scream that they used in that movie. It ended up getting used a bunch of times since then, hit Broken Arrow and got used by Howie Long and became the Howie scream from then on out. That's the reason why Dean isn't recording tonight. <laughs> I figured as much. I thought that might be why. He just does not want anything to do with the Wilhelm scream or the Howie scream. To me, it always just sounded like a TIE fighter. Like, it's 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 yeah. just like an octave too low to be a TIE fighter. It's not yeah. it's not my favorite scream. It's actually I think it's my least favorite next to Screaming Cat and Children Laughing. It's the same three sound effects you hear in every movie whenever there's a cat that's injured off camera. Mm. It's the same sound. Mm. Like every time I hear that, that's my like nails on chalkboard. Like I hate hearing it. But Wilhelm, I, I'm always excited to hear it. Ah, uh, the Howie scream is the one for me. Cause it it's just so it never fits with any scene it's ever in, and I think yeah. that's why I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. The only thing it's ever worked in is the intro to Ah Real Monsters. That's yeah. a good. That's a good spot for it. Yeah, I feel like we don't hear that one much anymore. Wilhelm, you you still hear pretty often, but the Howie scream, yeah. I feel like I don't hear often at all. Like it's outside of the early nineties. I think just because like, so one of them can be fit into things and probably sound normal. The Howie scream just it doesn't fit anywhere like you can't throw that into a battle scene in the background of like end game it's too long mm -hmm. yeah at least like a three second straight scream whereas wilhelm is like less than one also the howie scream is also it's it's so angry it's an angry scream yeah it's like they're not enjoying dying <laughs> it wasn't a surprise they're mad about it they saw it coming and they're like oh i didn't get past it <laughs> <laughs> So Hale has Deacon's dead to rights, uh, but Deacon says the detonator. So they end this in a fist fight, which calls back to the beginning of the movie. Oh, Christian Slayer's going to get his ass kicked. <laughs> which I like how you think like, oh, okay. So at the beginning of the movie, they explain the rope a dope and that's what we're going to do here. And it's like, no, they're just both fighting for their life throughout this thing. I don't think Christian Slater learned and decided like, I'm going to rope a dope him here. That was just kind of a throwaway thing. Um, and just so Hans Zimmer can name a track after it. Yeah, so clearly the reason that Christian Slater wasn't winning the boxing match was because he couldn't use boxes and kicks. <laughs> <laughs> if it was a no-holds-bar match, he would win 10 out of 10 times. So he lost the boxing match because he had to box. <laughs> as soon as he removed boxing... He's the dirty one the whole time. 
if they just could have fought straight out, it would have been fine. Although throwing crates at him, he's like, is this boxing? And it's like, <laughs> yes, but no. <laughs> I mean, actually, it's funny because in that train fight, there's a lot of like, quote unquote, boxing. There's like throwing boxes, landing on boxes. There's a crowbar, which is used to open <laughs> boxes. It has nothing to do with actual <laughs> professional boxing. <laughs> It's boxing adjacent. It's like, oh, we're boxing for real this time. It's like an AI understanding of boxing. <laughs> it's like generate a <laughs> boxing match for me. And it's just... <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So Hale tells Deacons he's out of his mind, which Deacon says, Ain't it cool? And a website is born, <laughs> which I never realized that Ain't It Cool News comes from his line in Broken Arrow. Of oh, like... all the movies to name a website after. Like, uh, you the man now, dog, came from Finding Forrester. Well, yes, but that has, like, one GeoCities page that we just referenced forever, and the other is, like, an actual media conglomerate of sorts. Like, I don't know how it is nowadays, but I know, like, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, like, Eating Cool News was massive, and it has broken air to think for that. <laughs> Bring you back. It's like, he actually started Ain't It Cool News. <laughs> <laughs> he actually survived the train, went on to start a, a media conglomerate. I'm putting 5%. I'm going to own of Ain't It Cool News. <laughs> He's like, I love that You're crazy. Line. Ain't it cool? I feel 5% isn't even enough to warrant, <laughs> like, even walking into the building for a stakeholders meeting, let alone, like, I feel like the GameStop bros had more stakes than he did. <laughs> so Terry decouples the train before getting in a gunfight that lights the train up, um, and Hale beats Deacons and escapes the train as the nuke is launched through the air, impaling and accepting Deacons. He had the most interesting look on his face of just like, he looks over, sees it coming, doesn't move out of the way, and then it, you just see his face and it's more like a, come on home. I mean, it, it's not even he doesn't get out of the way. He gets in a better position for it to hit him. Because, like, he gets knocked to the ground with his back up against the wall. And then as he sees what's about to happen, he, like, gets up <laughs> and, like, prepares himself. Like, and goes into, like, earth stance to just take this thing. <laughs> it, it, it's just like he, like he saw his whole plan coming to fruition. He's just like, yeah, this was how I was going to die. <laughs> Put that exclamation point on a really weird story. Let's go. Um <laughs> So he gets taken through there and the whole thing gets blown up and he gets destroyed and whatnot. Um, but Hale saves the day and finds $20. So considering he lost the 20 at the beginning of the movie, he actually nets to zero. Huh, is, that, um, is that where that saying comes from? When it, like, if you're ever like talking about like a really long, boring story, you're always supposed to end it with, and then I found $20. <laughs> <laughs> I like the first time they did the exchange too. Like, no, really, it's your twenty. Like, no, 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 it's your twenty. Like, no, really, it's your twenty. I stole it from your wallet when you were in the shower. I really like that line a lot. <laughs> so he finds twenty dollars and gets that back. Uh, and then Terry and Hale finally introduce themselves just at the end of the movie uh, before they leave and have a lot of explaining to do on why he came back to the military and then convinced his commanding officer and another guy to go out with him in a helicopter and those guys got blown up and he didn't. So I feel like there's an extra 10 minutes on this movie that r would get real interesting back at the Pentagon. That, that would, that's like we weeks got, uh, of, of congressional hearings. <laughs> yeah, right. I can only imagine the debriefings. I think he probably got like dishonorably discharged because it's like somebody's got to go to jail. <laughs> So you reclaim the nuke. Uh, no, I used it as a weapon to kill my former partner. Oh, okay. It's like After you, a boxing match. Do you have anyone who can testify to any of this? Like, no, they're, ev everyone, everyone's dead. I mean, there was that park <laughs> ranger, but she wasn't there for any of it. <laughs> There's the one park ranger, but we're actually now romantically involved. So that may be more biased in this story. Well, we're not actually sure if they're romantically involved. The, I don't the, think the, they were. I like. I liked that at the end they didn't do like a big kiss. Me like too. I, I, I'm just tired of like the, the the trauma, the like induced ro like relationships. What do you mean about speed? 
<laughs> where, where I'm just like, man, just because you're in a tra- traumatic situation together doesn't mean you're automatically like going to fall in love and try and make that work. And then the worst part, too, is like, and then always in the sequel, they broke up off camera. Yeah, because it just never Just for works. them to get back together in the sequel. Like, can we not do this trope anymore, please? Yeah, so it's just like them ending with like, hey, this is my name and like shake hand. I was just like, all right, good. I think I just assumed that there was like romantic leanings because the same writer did speed like the year before. And that that's the movie for trauma bonding. Romance. Oh, yeah. They, they, and there was inklings, but it was never like overt. So like it was. Yeah, I, I don't think the movie ever did it too intentionally. And if they did, it was just like little, little tiny hints. Like there was never any like real like bonding between them in that way. Yeah, which I appreciate. Mm-hmm. Movies are no place for romance. No place for romance. Get it, get it out of my action film. I just want like the the action channel all the time. Um, so that's Broken Arrow. I still enjoy it. I still like the movie. It had a lot of good moments in it. Yeah. I, I'll admit, like it's like some of it was cheesy, but I mean. My standard for movies for me to consider it to be like, I'm never watching this again is so difficult to cross that boundary. I mean, the first bad movie I think I've saw was The Village. So all my movie watching leading up to The Village, like I've seen a lot of bad ones. I still enjoy Pluto Nash and a lot of people will like look at me weird by saying that. But like, I thought it was fine. I didn't see the huge deal on how everyone's like panning it and how bad it is. But I mean, this was pretty good. It had its moments. I think at the end of the day, a lot of people who owe it, everything is turned into extremes. It's it's either this is the best thing ever or this is the worst film I've ever seen. And it's always a case of like, but then you need to see a lot more films because it's like, it's not good, but it's not terrible. Like, it's perfectly serviceable. I think this one here is in terms of if you look at it under the 90s action lens, like, yeah, this is a good movie. I enjoyed it. Like, it, I loved the acting from everybody in there. They're having a fun time. Everybody's really being like that, hamming it up for the that 90s action fair. The action scenes are done well. I think it, it's a lot of fun camera work here and there for the most part uh, from John Woo's team. Hey, if you enjoy a bad movie or if you enjoy a movie, just enjoy it. Nobody can take that away from you. Yeah, this one, I, I mean, I enjoyed roasting it a lot. But, I mean, it, 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 the whole point of a movie is for you to watch it from start to finish. And, yes, I may have been roasting it, but it had me engaged. So, I mean, the fact that if a movie can keep you engaged regardless of the content, I mean, I think it succeeds. Yeah, I, I, I also would say that a movie that is fun to, like, roast and riff is entertaining in its own merit. Because there are bad movies yeah. that you can't riff. Because, like, it's not, it's not, there's, there's no substance to it to play off of right yep. but with, yeah. with this you know you have great action sequences you it, it's cheesy john travolta is his acting in this like the character is deranged and weird and like it gives you this separate level of enjoyment where you're just like man this is wacky and like actually i'm kind of <laughs> here for that if i'm like i want to watch something that's kind of wacky like it's the same reason i watch face off or demolition man yeah I had like a counter going that I was excited for that every time an action sequence would begin and it would do like kind of like a far, like a mid length shot instead of a close up. How many times I would te- like easily tell like that's a stunt double versus like <laughs> that's actually Samantha Mathis or Christian Slater. You can always tell. And it was like a running tally that I, I enjoyed it because of that. Like, oh, here we go. Here we go. And one, two. <laughs> I think I count at least like five different occasions where you can tell it was that. I'm like, that's, that's, that's good. That's good. That keep you engaged. I know I can speak for all of the screen refresh crew, uh, including Dean. He's not here today, but I know he would agree. Broken Arrow is a great movie. So go find Dean and tell him you love Broken Arrow just as much as he does. And you're glad he brought it into your life. Also tell him how much you enjoy the Howie scream and the Wilhelm. Yes. All the stock screams. <laughs> I should look up every movie we've watched and do a total of how many we've encountered so far. Meanwhile, John Travolta is like, I put 5% in stock screams. It's a stock, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
So thank you again for coming along for the adventure on Broken Arrow. Uh, as always, you can find us on Twitter, not really anymore, Facebook, Instagram, at Screen Refresh, or email us your own movie memories at screenrefresh at gmail.com. If you like the show, help us out and leave a rating review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast to help others find us. If you like horror, check out our other show on the Screen Refresh Network called Don't Open This Podcast with me and new episodes every second and fourth Monday. For Nick and David... I'm Tim. It's been fun, and we'll see you in a couple weeks on Rule of Thirds. Insert Howie screen.